Hey everyone out there, welcome to another fantastic installment of Radio Free Decipher. Back after two weeks. That's uh, we had two weeks off? Well, it's been two weeks since we've done an RFD. Uh, I see. You see? I see. Because we were Got gone it. at right. DecipherCon. That's right. DecipherCon. DecipherCon 2002. 2002. And then Mark Tuttle gets the whole crowd to cheer. Anyway, right. uh, welcoming to the show. Oh, wait, wait. Before we get yes. to, to Dan here, uh, I'm Kyle, again. Uh-huh. And, 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 and I'm Evan. You're yeah. Evan. They just, and we're with interchangeable us today. They know who you are. And with us today, uh, they know who you are, too. Uh, Dan Bojanowski, head of the DGMA. Hey. Probably Welcome the, to the show. One of again. the hardest working guys at DecipherCon. Watch out. Long hours, man. Yeah. You were basically at the convention center. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You were at the convention center from, like, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. to 2 30 in the morning, pretty yep. much every single day. Yep. And I was just telling uh, someone in the office that one of my days, Saturday, was a 21 hour work day for me. Jeez. I went from 8 a.m. till 2 30 at the show, and then I went back to the office here um, That's right. until like 5, 5 o'clock in the morning. That to, was Saturday. That was Saturday to complete. I, I worked on the, the set for Yakubina, Player of the Year. Wow. Yeah, I was falling asleep at that point. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, later in the broadcast today, we're going to be calling uh, Matthew Yacobin, the player of the year. What a fabulous segue that would and be if we were calling him right now. That's right. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be chatting him up a little bit. Yeah. Well, tell us, you know, your experiences at DecipherCon, what you saw, and uh, what happened for um, everything. Yeah, well... I in my eyes, it was a great show. <laughs> um, everything went pretty pretty smoothly. There was um, a total of 91 tournaments scheduled throughout the four days. That's mm-hmm. outrageous. That's a lot. That's a lot of stuff going on. So anyone who said they didn't have anything to do, I don't know where they were. <laughs> um, but uh, all the tournaments were, um, you know, most of them went off without a hitch. But um, the, we had the largest uh, decipher tournament ever in history. We broke our previous record. 195. Uh, yes. It was oh. previous records 193 at Origins Premier Series Day One, and this one was nice. um, the World Championship Day One um, qualifier, 195. And also of note, um, during at the same time that that tournament started, the 195 player tournament, at the exact same time there was a 50 player uh, sealed, deck. sealed deck qualifier right. for Day One. So and there was there was a total of like 100 and or 245 people playing in a day one qualifier at the right. same time. That was just Lord of the Rings. That was wow. just Lord yep. of the Rings. There was also some Trek tournaments going on at that time and a Two Towers pre-release, I believe, which had you know 40 to 50 people. So outrageous. Lots of gaming. <laughs> so um, well, like let's start with the Lord of the Rings World okay. Championship, and then we'll move into Trek um, and the other games. We had uh, for Lord of the Rings, we had a three-day competition. We had four day one tournaments where people could qualify to move on. Uh, as Kyle just stated, there were first 10 a.m. started off with a 195-person uh, constructed, and you know 20 people qualified from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a 51-person sealed deck, and that was good fun. The players got to choose their starter decks, and they got one booster of each uh, fellowship block tournament, uh, fellowship block booster pack. Mm-hmm. Um, then we moved on to another constructed at 5 p.m. with a multi- and a multiplayer at 5 p.m. as well, both of them getting some sizable crowds. So a total of on um, day one for Lord of the Rings, a total of 45 people qualified for day two, um, and at good gaming all the way through. We didn't end up finishing until right, right, right at right at 2 a.m. I think we, yeah. we wrapped up. Yeah. Well, well you don't go to DecipherCon to sleep. No, not so much. <laughs> And then those 45 people uh, advanced day two to meet 50 other people yep. to play in two heats That's uh, for 95 people um, to advance to the top 16. That's correct. We had two separate heats, and each of them, you know, we took the top eight from each mm-hmm. to get our top 16 for day three. In your mind, which was the tougher heat mm, qualifying? That's tough. Um, I think <laughs> we, the way we did it was was a pretty fair way of di- distributing the, the high-ranked players because we took all the players that showed up, gave them a ra- their rating, put the rating down there, and put an alternated, you know, this one goes in tournament A, this one B, A, B, A, B, and so we had okay. an equal number of high players in each tournament. Um, there was obviously top-level competition in both of them, so I can't really pick a favorite. If sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. If you look at it though from from a high hindsight point of view, um, <laughs> tournament A had the world champion, the runner up, the third place player, the fifth place player. So like, you know, four of the top five players. Perhaps as luck would have it. <laughs> sure. I did not know that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, you're Mr. Stat. Yeah. 
Well, that's what I do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, obviously, uh, we had day three then, which was a top 16 single elimination, best mm-hmm. two out of three untimed games, lots of good fun, ended up having the final um, between Matthew Brochu and Alex Tennant. Mm-hmm. Very exciting final game, or final match. Uh, Matthew, obviously, if The you crowd heard, was really into it as well. Yeah, Matthew Brochu walked away with $7,000, the ring, the car, the trip, all that good stuff, so... Congratulations to him. A yeah. fabulous prize package. Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, all this was going on also. We had the, the Star Trek World Championship mm-hmm. going on, which is exciting in its own right. Um, they had um, you know, a bunch of people for day one, and uh, how many people qualified? Uh, they five? advanced. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly how many advanced, Four but then they met up with all of the... The day two, day two right, people. and that was a pack of about forty, I yep. believe. Yep. Any notable recollections from that day? I, I, I uh, you know, I didn't judge the, on the second day. I came in and judged on the third day, so I only got to see who the top sixteen were. But that certainly was a you know sampling of recognizable names. David sure. Bowling made the top sixteen. Mike Harrington, both past champions. Uh, Chris Sonstaby, who has been in many championships. Uh, we had Franklin Kenter, who of sure. course went on to win. Uh, but he had been a well-known figure in some of the high... Any of the uh, big training. names not make it into day three? Do you remember? Uh, well, let's Dale see. Dale Hannock didn't make it. Dale Hannock just missed. He qualified for day two, but uh, he's been in several world championships. Let's see. Um, trying to remember. Uh, Todd Soper was not at DeciphraCon this year, so he was kind of missed by a few people. Uh, I, they're, you know... Yeah, it was quite a furious uh, <laughs> final game. Uh, final game. The the play was going back and forth so fast. Yeah, yeah it was really interesting to watch. There is some extreme card manipulation uh, possibilities in in the first edition of Star Trek right now. And uh, Franklin Kenter was using, you know, what I constantly heard like several times throughout the weekend was that. He was using a style of deck that was very popular. It was a known style of deck, but the, his version of it was the best one that anybody had ever seen. I kept hearing that. This is the best manipulation deck I've ever seen. Wow. It was very, very amusing to watch. I, I really <laughs> enjoyed watching that final. Yes, I, uh, you know, not, not to knock the Lord of the Rings final, but that was a little slow-paced for my <laughs> taste at times. But, uh, I, was, I was the guy running the camera switch, you know, switching back and forth between angles. And at times, Franklin was going so fast, I couldn't follow his, his like, where, his, where he was playing cards yeah. and what he was drawing. And I was just like, uh, this is crazy. And, and not just so Franklin, fast. actually, his opponent, John Corbett, I mean, who was not using as fast-paced a deck, but had a lot of things going on during his mm-hmm. turn. And, I, and <laughs> the cameraman that was trying to cover John's uh, hand was, like, cursing a little bit. <laughs> Cause, <laughs> yeah, because he couldn't follow either, right? It was kind of funny. Uh, and he, there was a lot of copies of Beyond the Subatomic, 30 Beyond the Subatomic and yeah. 27 Palatoffs or something? Yeah, a lot of those two cards, and then there were other bits of the engine that he didn't have to use as many copies of those cards because Subatomic and Paler would get to them uh, right. quicker, but also Smith as an Android's Bottom was a big component of that deck, all threes was a big component of that deck. It seems like that deck was all about mathematics, all about ratios and having the right you know, numbers of cards right. mathematically in your deck. Well, it also is, uh, there are two other elements. One is knowing the rules well and knowing kind of, you know, I hate to say loopholes, but for example, all threes, uh, and I know a lot of people are confused about this, it says that you take cards into your hand. It's not drawing cards, so... That is a card that you're allowed to use to get additional cards in your hand after you've played a Q's tent. So that was news to some people, and, and Franklin and a few other players were aware of that, and so we're using it. Also, it just has a lot to do with how you use the cards. I mean, Franklin, to watch him play it, he played it very intelligently. I mean, he has a very tall deck, and at one point he regenerated, and he only had two copies, I believe, of uh, Smooth as an Android's Bottom in his deck, but before he regenerates, he'd pay talk to get one back in his hand so that next turn, even though he had regenerated, he'd be ready to spit through the combo again. So, you know, it's just awareness of what the pieces are and what order they should be used in. He was always, you know, remembering to do the right things in the right sequence. So it was, it was just very well played as well. Now, how do, you, how do you come to the decision that I need 30 instead of 31 or 29? Where do you, where do you <laughs> draw the line? Well, I, I can't tell you. I'm, I'm not in his head there. Uh, 
Um, it, it mostly you are looking at the, the – there are really three banks of cards sort of to, to that kind of strategy. One is the uh, personnel and ships, you know, the, that you're actually going to be using to score your points with. Um, the middle bank is your – other pieces of the engine, things you're only stocking a couple of copies of, things like all threes and smooths and androids bottom and those cards that are sort of like your engine grease. And then there's the bank of everything else. And that, that third bank, you know, that ratio is what you're looking at in relation to the other two. So it's not necessarily that you're saying, I want 30 copies of Beyond the Subatomic. You're just saying that this section of my deck, the section that's Beyond the Subatomic and Paler Tops, has to be half my deck or it has to be uh, three quarters of my deck or whatever whatever the ratio is so now there was another really kind of interesting thing that happened during the Star Trek World Championships there mm -hmm. was the final game there was a Q's planet out on the table uh -huh. and I thought you might bust my chops on that no no no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not busting anyone's no, chops on okay. that but um, the, you know they were at such a high concentration level and they you know Right. Franklin is doing all this stuff with his deck, and John's trying to pay attention to it. And when Franklin scores over 100 points, he has not yet solved the Q's, That's correct. The Q's planet, which means, says that you have to have 140 points. Right. Well, he gets over 140, uh, over 100 points, Franklin does, and John basically extends his hand and says, congratulations, you right. won. Well, and they both forgot about the Q's planet. Yeah, and, and so did we, the judges. It was sure. on the far end of the table in the darkness. But uh, i I, I got to tell you, John was just really kind of doing the sportsman thing, and it, it was sort of a – he was having a tough game. And I'll tell you, he had the tools to stop Franklin and just missed on a couple of occasions. Um, his Q continuum side deck had hide-and-seek which, uh, unless you draw that dilemma itself in the selection, you're guaranteed to stop at least one person, you know, even if the one you draw is universal. Uh, Franklin, at one point, attempted a mission and hit a Q-Flash, and uh, hide-and-seek did not come up. He's using, like, a 14, 16-card side deck, had two copies of hide-and-seek in it, draws eight or nine cards out of that side deck, and gets neither one of the hide-and-seeks, and so consequently didn't get that stop. Uh, then goes on to hit... Uh, a, um, alien Parasites, which has a 32 integrity threshold, and Franklin made it by one. He had 33 integrity. So if mm -hmm. any one guy that he had had in his group had been stopped, then control of those personnel would have transferred over to John, and John would have been able to really ruin you know, Franklin's game by basically red up against the next dilemma and, and killing off the crew. So... I, you know, that was just a case of bad math, bad draw. He had the tools there and just couldn't catch a break. So, And that was one of about two situations where he wasn't catching a break. Plus, John had already played Franklin in round two of day three. He had seen the deck, kind of knew what he had to do. So it, it had to be a very frustrating game for John. So seeing Franklin's deck work so well in that final game and, and just seeing it start to run out of control, I, he had to, you know, just be a little disappointed and feel he didn't have a chance. So... Once he sees Franklin start to score, you know, first he's got 60, then he's got 80, then he's got 100 plus, all in rapid succession, he, you know, basically just overlooked it and was, you know, ready to be done with the game, was essentially acknowledging that he had been beaten. So I saw it as a rather sportsmanlike movie, even if unintentional. And, sure. and then also, the only dilemma that was under Q's planet was God, which would not have been difficult for Franklin to just go over there and beat. So, um, so really, I don't think the outcome of the game would have changed. We just overlooked that that was sitting sure. down there. Sure. Well, so congrats, congratulations to Franklin Kenter for yeah, being the Trek World Champion. And to John Corbett as well for yeah. making the finals. And, and one other name I want to mention just quickly, because I've seen a lot of um, sort of gossip about this on the BBS. On, on the third day, the, the player Tyler Fultz, who dropped after the first round, um, there is some confusion about the circumstances there and about him being disqualified or anything like that, and that's not the case at all. Uh, Tyler Fultz was a very nice guy. I was very pleased to meet him, and he inadvertently left a card both out of his deck and out of his deck list uh, that was crucial to his deck. It was Beware of Q, which was like the linchpin card that made the whole deck work, and it, you know... We had done deck checks before any of the games on day three started, but because it was neither in the deck nor on the list, we could not spot a discrepancy. So when he got into his first game, tried to access that card and found that it wasn't there, he asked for his deck list. We checked the list, and sure enough, it wasn't there as well. So we had no recourse but to not allow him to add the card. And because it was crucial to his strategy, he chose to drop. He was not disqualified. He didn't do anything wrong. 
And I just wanted to make that abundantly clear because, um, you know, he's a nice guy and doesn't deserve the reputation that I think some people on the BBS have mistakenly saddled him just with. Just an unfortunate, cir uh, yes. unfortunate circumstance. We can't just allow people yeah. to add cards to the deck in the middle right. of a world championship. So. So, but uh, it is important to know that he was in second place coming off of day two, so a very top quality player, and I'm hoping that he returns next year because uh, I, I think he has what it takes to do very well in the world championship. So cool. there you go, moving on. Well, we also um, just want to you know, recognize those champions that won for the Star Wars game. For yes. Two. Um, Angelo Consoli from Germany mm -hmm. uh, won at, I believe, like around 5.30 <laughs> yeah. in yeah. the morning on the Sunday. The quite a lot record, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Apparently, he, apparently there was like th that was like the longest tournament ever or something. Yeah, it started at it started at basically about 10:30 a.m. on Saturday outrageous. and finished at 5:30 in the morning on Sunday. Outrageous! Yeah, that's, crazy. That's card playing so dedication. Congratulations to um, Angelo Consoli. Um, Jeff Kahan won uh -huh. the Jedi Knights World Championship. Um, good job to Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jason Kilby won the Young Jedi World Championship. So yes. Congratulations, Congrats to Jason. All them. All right. Cool. I didn't really get to watch any of those finals. Well, obviously, I didn't watch the well, Star Wars one because it was so late in the morning. But uh, I saw Jeff playing throughout the day, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really glad he won. Good, good for Jeff. So, Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, Dan, any other uh, parting shots about DecipherCon and uh, maybe uh, what what's on the plate for next year or for later this year? Um well, you guys, <laughs> just, you just had a big meeting and kind of mapped out a lot of premiere series yeah, and big events for the, the for this next year for Lord of the Rings. Yes, huh? we did. Um, uh, Any uh, hints? Well, I'll, I'll give you a hint that la this past year we had uh, four premiere series events. We had one in Origins, San Diego, Atlanta, and Essen. Mm -hmm. um, next year we're um, we're probably going to have seven. Ooh. Um, Ooh. Which is which is a big number. Um, All right. And and you know. I think we're looking at this point. We're looking at four in the U.S. and three internationally. So you can uh, start guessing where, cool. where those will be. Um, but we'll surely put up a schedule uh, towards the beginning of the year, so you guys have plenty of time to plan. Excellent. And you might want to start uh, if you haven't already pre-registered or signed up for a Premier Series qualifier. Um, you might want to try to get those in your area. The application is on DGMA.com right now and you will need to have at least one premier point to be able to play in a premier series event. So okay. you can get those through premier series qualifiers. All right. right. Cool. cool. And premier points last for a year. One so calendar year. So, so all the people that have played this year and have premier points right now are qualified yep. for the majority of the premier first, series. Yeah, anyone who year. has gotten top 16 in any level three events or played in any of the first couple premier series qualifiers um, and gotten points, those are good until one year after they're earned. So should be all set. Good stuff. Speaking of Premier Points, uh, let's now try and get on the phone our Premier Points DGMA Player of the Year, um, Matthew Yacobina. Yako. All right. Uh, we have Matthew Yacobina, otherwise known as Yako, on the phone. How are you doing today? Good. How are you guys doing? Very good. Very good. Um, tell us a little bit about what it means to be Player of the Year. Well, I don't know. To me, it means a lot because, like, you have to be consistent to do it. So, like, I'm happy I got it. Sure. Speaking of consistency, um, what what all what tournaments did it take? Did you play in that uh, helped you get enough premier points to be na uh, named Player of the Year? Well, there was Origins where I finished seventh, and Continentals where I finished seventh, and World Cup, which was sixth, and Atlanta, which I won. Really? So they were all top eight performances. Yeah, yeah. That is awesome, man. And it came right down to the wire, too, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. If Patrick would have won against Matthew in the semifinals, then he would have been player of the year. At, at the World Championships? Yeah, yeah. So Matthew wound up taking third at the World Championships and finished only two points behind you in the player uh, of the year race. Yeah, yeah. That's very close. So they, Dan and Scott, presented you with a very fun trophy um, at DeciphraCon. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so... Uh, we were always kidding about like the donuts being the prize because I was always being bothering bothersome to them. <laughs> <laughs> so it was funny to have the donuts. They were really good too. Yeah, they were. Yeah, evidently from the the story that I hear is that you kept you know going up to Scott and Dan at all the different Premier Series events and you know basically saying, hey, what do I get if I win Premier Player of the Year? You know, Player of the Year. And uh, they kept going, I don't know, you know, 
go away. <laughs> and finally, like, I guess Scott, it was, basically said, you, you get a box of donuts if you win. Yeah. And the cool thing is, is that they presented you with a box of donuts at for the Player of the Year award. I mean, you got you got a complete set of all the foils from the fellowship block too, but uh the donuts were pretty cool. Yeah, the donuts were the better part of the prize. It was the better part of the prize, <laughs> right on. And you shared those donuts with uh, all your buds, huh? Yeah, yeah. Speaking of uh that, you also share all of your prize money. Yeah, yeah. Tell us how how why you guys do that. Well, like it's better and then and there's not many like there's not as many hard feelings when you lose to one of your friends like pretty far in a top tournament because you think whatever it's one of us it doesn't matter who wins as long as we win right so how many of the guys up there in quebec do you share uh the prize money with well like it depends on who's winning and who's part of the top 16 and stuff usually we'll do like only the people who make top 16 but like i said it depends on who's there how many we are like at Origins, we were nine, so we couldn't split with everyone. <laughs> right on. Um, so, so far, your your team up there has won somewhere in the neighborhood of over four thousand dollars now. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. So it's looking because good. Patrick. I don't know. Do you share? Do you do the money sharing with Patrick as well? Uh, not this year, but starting next year, we will. Okay, because yeah, he just won a big, two big okay. chunks, I think. Yeah, yeah. Himself, so uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of like four thousand dollars himself, because he got three thousand, or he got two thousand five hundred at uh, Essen, and he got one thousand five hundred at World Championships. So <laughs> he has more than all of us combined. Yeah, that's a lot of money. So yeah. he's definitely a player to keep an eye on next year. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, the talk to us about your your uh, sponsorship now that you have. Well, that's it. Next year, me, Dominic, Yannick, and Patrick are going to be sponsored uh, with my work, which is Jilly's of Bar in Montreal. Mm-hmm. And so they're going to sponsor us to go to all the big events. They're going to put about $2,000 in the bank account a month, maybe more, maybe less, depending on how many we'll need to go everywhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's it. So we're going to go to all the tournaments. Whenever we win money, we put it back in the bank account. Uh-huh. And at the end of the year, we give the sponsors back what they gave, and maybe 10 more percent. Wow. And we split the rest between us four. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. That is really cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be great. Just so you know, I don't know, I don't think this has been announced really um, other than earlier in this broadcast, but there are going to be seven premier events next year, premier series events. Cool, nice. I didn't know that. So four in North America and uh, three more internationally. So... Lots of opportunity for you guys to go and win a bunch. Yeah, yeah, it'll be great. Now, your team, again, is yourself, uh, Yannick Lapointe, Dominic, oh, man, I always mess his last name up. Gaudreau. <laughs> sure. And uh, <laughs> and um, Patrick Malboeuf, Bad yeah. Beef. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now, how cool is it for you guys that – Canadians, or more specifically, Quebecors, have won three of the last four major tournaments. Well, like, it's awesome, because we're really showing that Quebec has good players and that they can win stuff. And it's nice to see, like, non-Americans winning everything. <laughs> they haven't won much this year. They didn't win the World Cup. They haven't won the last, you know, the World Championships, Premier Essen, Premier Atlanta. I think uh, North Americans only took, uh, or uh, Americans only took... Um, San Diego and um, Origins. So. And Continentals. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and Continentals. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, hey, three and three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice rivalry, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you guys have so many more people in us. So. Yeah, but uh, you guys are definitely dominating the whole scene right now. But we have an advantage because our player base is a lot smaller, and all our good players live close to our other. Right. So right. it's such a practice, such a match now, Matthew Boshu, he lives up in Quebec City, right? Yeah, yeah. How often do you guys get to go up there and play with them? And did you know him very much before the World Championships? Well, I knew him from Star Wars a bit. And uh, we used to have tournaments that were outside of Montreal, and the Quebec people would drive down. So I played him a few times with Lord of the Rings, and I played him at Provincials. But uh, otherwise, we don't go up there much. Only Patrick went up there like during the summer, and he played him a lot. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Matthew's a cool guy, though. I like playing Star Wars games, and, like, we started at about the same time, so we were learning that game together. Right on. Right on. What did you think of uh, his deck and his performance at the World Championships? 
you did really good with that deck. Uh, it was good. It made me kind of think about the deck that Dominic and I used to play at Origins with the four self and four intuitions. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, like, it was a cross of Badgie's deck with the four such little things. Well, just the fellowship part. So, yeah, it was a good deck, though. Like, it did good. It was great against Surakai. And that's all you really needed to match against in that top 16. So. Yeah, I guess top 16 was pretty much all Urukai and one Nazgul, huh? Yeah, yeah. So he definitely had the good deck of the day. Yeah. So congratulations to him. And congratulations to you again. Player of the year. Got the box of donuts. You know, uh, and people are g- got the sponsorship. People are going to be gunning for you guys next year. Yeah, it'll be great. I can't wait to see you guys there. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at uh, probably in um, March. Yeah. All right. We'll talk All to right. you soon. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye. Okay. So that about wraps it up for this week. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yako, for joining us. Thanks, uh, Bojo, as well. And, uh, oh, those of you who are looking for second edition information, uh, well, obviously we've had about a half-hour broadcast here, but there's plenty of good stuff to be had if you go check the backlog of the uh, everything else Star Trek BBS because I did a chat there yesterday that was full of lots of cool info. Chalk full. Yeah. Uh, two hours I was there, man. So, wow, that's, you know, that's going to be a lot of info. Yes, so check that out, and uh, we will leave you with that. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Talk to you next week.